Gee, I'm sure glad to see you, kid. Gee, Ollie, you know, this is just like old times. You and I have been together. Well, you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> we sure used to have a lot of fun, didn't we? We sure did. You remember how dumb I used to be? Yeah. Well, I'm better now. Well, I'm certainly glad to hear it. Hello, hello, one and all, and welcome to the Laurel and Hardy podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Vasey, the editor of the all-new Laurel and Hardy magazine and the author of the forthcoming epic book, Laurel and Hardy Silence. And it's great to be back with you again as we explore the wonderful world of Laurel and Hardy. Now, on the podcast, our aim is to chronicle Stan and Babe's career, taking deep dives into the production history of each one of their films together, from their first meeting in 1921's The Lucky Dog, and following their experiences right through to 1951's Atoll K. On the last episode, episode 35, we just entered the era of talking pictures with the boys' first talkie, Unaccustomed As We Are, where I was joined by my special guests, Randy Scretvet and Richard W. Ban, and we had a great time discussing that historically significant picture. If you haven't heard it yet, don't miss it. Feedback has been incredibly positive, including this five-star review just left by B. Moppet a few days ago on Apple Podcasts. Quote, wonderful stuff, five stars. If you're a Laurel and Hardy fan, then you've got to listen and subscribe to this podcast. I stumbled across Patrick's podcast a couple of weeks ago when I was looking for Randy Scretvet's book, Laurel and Hardy, The Magic Behind the Movies, and I'm glad I did. Just wow. Listen to number 35 and now working my way from the first podcast onwards. Already on to number 10. Patrick is very knowledgeable and his enthusiasm and rapport with his guests is brilliant. I've learned so much already and can't wait until the silence book is issued. So thank you so much for leaving that review, Beamop. It it means such a lot to receive feedback like that. Now, today's episode is a milestone special as we are celebrating the podcast's fourth anniversary. And what a birthday treat I've got for you. In this special bonus episode, we're stepping away from our deep dives on the films, uh, as we sometimes do, to bring you an interview with a lifelong Laurel and Hardy fan, film historian and author, the legendary film critic Leonard Maltin. Leonard and I recently sat down and discussed his love of Stan and Ollie, his Laurel and Hardy book, his favourite films and much, much more. You're going to love it. A special video episode of our chat was made available to all patrons of the podcast on our Patreon page very recently, Um, and there's also a special exclusive podcast with Leonard about to go live on there shortly too. So do head over to patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, to join us there uh, and gain access to a whole host of other exclusive podcasts as well, including magazines and much more besides. So that's my little preamble over for today. Let's get straight to today's very special guest, the one and only Leonard Maltin. Our guest today is one of the most recognised and respected film critics of our time. He became a household name as the film critic on Entertainment Tonight from 1982 to 2010, and also as the author of his famous and indispensable movie guides. Among the many other hats that he wears, he is also a lecturer and film historian, and the many book titles that he's published over the years include The Best 151 Movies You've Never Seen, The Disney Films, Of Mice and Magic, A History of the American Animated Cartoons, The Little Rascals, The Life and Times of Our Gang, and notably for fans of Stan and Ollie, of course, in 1973, he published one of the first books on the boys, simply titled The Laurel and Hardy Book. Throughout his career, he has interviewed everybody who is anybody in Hollywood, and now, unfortunately for him, he is sitting in front of me. Today's guest is, of course, the one and only Leonard Maltin. Leonard, welcome to the Laurel and Hardy podcast. I'm very happy to be here, Patrick. Thank you. Oh, it's it's wonderful to have you with us, Leonard. We're so blessed to have you on the show today. Uh, and I'm a huge fan of all that you do and are involved in. Uh, but I've got to say, it feels a little bit strange because I'm, I'm quite used to sitting watching you and Jesse chatting on a sofa. Um, but now you're talking to me. So it, it's uh, it's a real treat, a real treat. Um, now, we've got so <laughs> much... We've got so much to talk about, and I've got so many questions that I'd love to ask you, but I'm going to try and keep it as tight as possible. The answers um, are no... <laughs> 1953 and possibly 
1953. I wonder what the question is for that one. That'll be interesting. I don't know either. <laughs> okay, so uh, what I like to do with all guests, Lenny, when we start, is just to ask you uh, a little bit about yourself in terms of where your interest in uh, classic film, specifically classic comedies, came from. Um, and, and obviously, with regards to Laurel and Hardy, can you remember what your earliest memories of Laurel and Hardy are? That would be wonderful. Well, the, the two answers kind of uh, collide or, or converge, I should say, because I'm a child of the first television generation here in the U.S. <clears throat> I was born in December of 1950, so there was never a time that there wasn't a television set in, in our family home. And uh, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, when I was growing up, TV was like a living museum of movies. Uh, now, uh, one has to turn on, uh, here, in the, here in the U.S., Turner Classic Movie Channel uh, to see any kind of old movies. But then, and New York, uh, I, I was born in Manhattan, lived there until I was four. We moved to the suburbs of Teaneck, New Jersey, very close into the city. There were seven channels in New York City. Uh, and they had a lot of time to fill. So they filled it with old comedy shorts and old cartoons, as well as old feature films. So in those days, I just had to describe this to my 20 something students at University of Southern California last week. You had to actually get up and turn the dial <laughs> yeah. on the television set. There was no such thing as a remote control. Yeah. Everything I tell them makes me sound like I'm from the Cro-Magnon era. <laughs> uh, but um, but anyway, uh, anywhere you turned on the dial, you, you were likely as not to hit an old movie. Uh, it, you know, it, you you it was inescapable. In the case of Laurel and Hardy, it was deliberate because I started watching them. I don't know. I could have been three or four years old, and I watched them virtually every day of my life because they were on every day for a half hour, as were the Little Rascals, our gang, another Hal Roach, you know, uh, product. Product, that's a terrible word. Another <laughs> Hal Roach series. <laughs> uh, and later, the Three Stooges comedies. Uh, and they even showed a silent comedy short uh, in, in various ways. Then when I was seven years old, my parents took me to a now uh, defunct uh, theater that was called the Guild Theater on 50th Street in 5th and 6th Avenues, right behind Radio City Music Hall. Oh, okay. I always thought it was a mistake. Somebody made a terrible mistake. Why would you put a movie theater next to the world's largest movie theater? <laughs> uh, well, it turns out Radio City Music Hall wasn't intended to be a movie theater. It was intended right. to be a live performance showcase. Uh, and they changed their minds on that within six months of opening, I think. Oh, wow. So the Guild Theater, I'm rambling now. No. And, we, and we've just started, so that's not a good sign. <laughs> the Guild Theater had outside a life size cutout standee of Laurel and Hardy and Gene Harlow from Double Whoopie. Inside was the feature film by Robert Youngson called The Golden Age of Comedy. And that's the first time I saw Laurel and Hardy on a big screen. And it's the first time I was exposed to their silent comedy, some of their best scenes from some of their best silent comedies. And uh, if I wasn't already uh, a fan, or, uh, then that, that sort of clinched the deal. And uh, the the difference, the only difference between me and other kids my age, well, there are a lot of differences. I didn't play sports. <laughs> uh, uh, main thing is I had curiosity about, about these shorts and these cartoons and these comedies I was watching. Yeah, and I wanted to learn more about them. Uh, I think I was either ten or eleven when John McCabe's book Mr. Laurel and Mr. Hardy came out. And uh, I took it out from my, I checked it out of my public library, which was in walking distance of my house, Teaneck, New Jersey. 
and then returned it and checked it out again, and then returned it and checked it out again. <laughs> it, took, it took some years before I, I finally bought my own hardcover copy. <laughs> but, uh, so, so it all stems from that. And when I was 13, I formed the Tit for Tat Tent of Teaneck. Oh, yes. Yes, I, I understand that. Yeah, 13 years old, first sanctioned junior tent. Is that right? Absolutely right. Oh, wow, that's incredible. That's incredible. Because I know Randy, Randy speaks about uh, he was too young to get in, but he managed to wangle his way in. But they actually sanctioned a junior tent. That's incredible. Jack McCabe said yes. That's wonderful. So, um, And I, I guess this is as good a moment as any to show you my most significant piece of Laurel and Hardy. Oh, <gasps> oh look at that that thanks leonard good luck always stan that's beautiful that's beautiful now is that is that to you leonard are yes. you are you the leonard in that i'm the one who i'm the one who wrote a combination a get well letter and fan letter to stan oh fantastic uh, at the st john's hospital in santa monica oh wow he'd had, he'd had a heart attack uh he recovered from that perhaps not fully but he he recovered enough to to go home to the um oceana right right and, um oh that's fantastic that's what that's what brought me that in return isn't that lovely that's it's super so lovely. It, it's very precious uh, yes well i i asked i asked that because i have this one which has my uh -huh. name on it but that's not me. That's a different Patrick. I don't know who it is, but thank God they they asked for one. <laughs> yes. So, but yeah, to have that is oh, actually from Stan to you. That's beautiful. That's really nice. Thank you for sharing that. Isn't that a pip? It certainly is. Yeah, I just I was just interested to ask you actually because I know you're a huge fan of silent comedy. Um, do you think? Seeing Stan and Ollie in the silence, in the Youngson film, so young, do you think that gave you more of a um, of, of a love for the silent Laurel and Hardys? Sure. Yeah. Oh, sure. And, and by the way, uh, I eventually got to meet and become friendly with Robert Youngson. Oh, wow. Wow. Which, which, which was neat and which enabled me to thank him for changing, really altering the course of my life. Yes. Yeah. That film was, was a... Tremendous influence on me. And the others that, that followed when comedy was king, Days of Thrills and Laughter, uh, The Further Perils of Laurel and Hardy, Four Clowns, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. A number of guests I've had on have said very similar. You know, the Youngson films was their gateway to Stan and Ollie. So, yeah, he's. Uh, 30 years from that's when I left out. Fantastic. Now that's, that's wonderful. Um, so, why do you think, as a, as a critic, as opposed to a fan. Why do you think Laurel and Hardy are so loved, Leonard, almost like a hundred years after they were making these wonderful films? You know, what is it about Laurel and Hardy that's so special? I know it's a big question, but. Well, they created characters who seemed real. As exaggerated as their uh, misadventures were, comic exaggeration, they seemed like real people a little dumber than the average person, uh, a little uh, more gullible than the average person, uh, a little more unlucky <laughs> than the average <laughs> yes. person. Yeah. Uh, all of those things. But they were they were genuine. Yes. And uh, I think that's the key, is that they, they, uh, they're not playing stick figures. They're playing real people. And, and it, it only occurred to me many years later how odd but perfectly natural it seemed that one had a British accent and one had a Southern accent. You couldn't plan something like that. You wouldn't plan something like that. <laughs> that you, never right. would, you never would team up two people who were supposed to be close friends. Yeah. From, you know, clearly yeah, we're from a good point. parts of the yeah. world. Yeah, but as you say, it works, isn't it? It absolutely works. Plus, they're funny. Well, that's that's the yeah the main thing, isn't it? The short answer is they're funny. They're, yeah, absolutely. Do you do you find them funnier than Keaton and Lloyd and Chaplin? Because obviously they you know they're always mentioned in the same kind of terms. But 
I always find myself, I mean, I love all of them, but I, I, I find myself really laughing at Laurel and Hardy, whereas the others I, I'm more kind of um, impressed by the art, I suppose. No, I, 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 think, I think I'm with you there. I, I, I revere all of them. Mm. Chaplin is kind of a god to me. Yeah. And um, I met Buster Keaton. I know. I want to ask you about that. I have to ask you about that. Um, but Laurel and Hardy, I think, produce more laughter. At last, you're using my brain. Um, your Laurel and Hardy book, Leonard, I mentioned it briefly in the introduction. Um, I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the, the sort of genesis of that book. I mean, obviously, you've written lots and lots of books in your time. Um, and, uh, of course, you love Laurel and Hardy, which is a good, a good enough reason as any. But, you know, what, how did that come about? And what was the background to writing that book? Uh, it, it's uh, kind of mundane, but I will tell you. I, and I, you hadn't mentioned that I, the second book I ever wrote was a movie comedy theme. Oh, of course, yes. Where I first got to write about Stan and Ollie. Yes, yes. And uh, uh, that was great fun. Um, I, the man who hired me when I was 17 years old and a high school senior to do my first, to, to compile my first book, which was a, uh, the first edition of that movie guide yeah, under the terrible title TV Movies, yes, <laughs> which had 8,000 capsulized movie reviews, uh, was when he hired me was at a company called New American Library. And within a year or two of, of that uh, life-changing experience, uh, he moved to a company called uh, Curtis Books, which was kind of a low-end paperback company, owned by a very big company, but they, they themselves were kind of small potatoes. And he said, I want you to do a series of film books for me. I, I don't expect you to write them. I expect you to hire writers. You know, uh, made me what was called in the trade a book packager, which uh, I was not entirely comfortable doing. But what it meant was that I would be on the lookout for manuscripts or authors with ideas for books, any X dollars, I would then contract with the authors, yeah. take a fee off the top, and then hire them to write books. And I, uh, I'm i not sorry I did it because I got a lot of good books into print. Uh, that was very satisfying. So uh, I decided that, uh, well, why not, uh, compile a, a book with sort of odds and ends, articles, informational pieces, uh, and uh, miscellany on Laurel and Hardy, like the like that list of uh, uh, titles they came up with for the 20 minute TV adaptations of their feature film. Yes. Yeah. All of which were terrible. <laughs> But but they ran them all the time on on, on the lo local television, right? And um, anyway, so I actually have a piece by John McCabe, their biographer. Mm. Yeah, it's in, a lovely piece in my book, and uh, two pieces by him, and a filmography. The first attempt at a filmography by Richard Band. The Laurel and Hardy book. My big, my, my 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 big dream, which I got to realize, was getting them to hire Al Kilgore to do the cover artwork. It's a beautiful on. cover. It's a great caricature. I love that. Yeah. Anyway, I learned then that uh, art directors do not like being told who to hire, <laughs> and so. Here I was trying to get a paying job for my friend uh, Al Kilgore, who'd been so kind and who helped welcome me into the Sons of the Devil. And and it turned into a bit of a kerfuffle. But also well that ends well. I have Al Kilgore artwork on the cover. Of the That's how it came about. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you mentioned about Buster Keaton, Leonard. I, re I really want to hear this because I love Buster Keaton. And um, I mean, I, I've, I have heard you tell the story before, but it is such a good one. Uh, I'm going to ask you to tell me the, the same story because it's a great one. Well, I, 
let's say I lived in Teaneck, New Jersey, which was a close in suburb of New York, five miles from the George Washington Bridge. And uh, in those days, uh, we were either more innocent or more ignorant. And <laughs> my parents allowed me to travel by myself or, and with, with a friend <laughs> right. into the big bad city. That's the first mistake we've made since that guy sold us the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh, buying that bridge was no mistake. That's going to be worth a lot of money to us someday. And uh, my uh, my oldest friend, Louis Black, not the comedian Louis Black, but the other Louis Black, I'll call him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're going to go, go. It was uh, summer off from school. We were going to go to go to Manhattan for the day. And uh, but before we left, I, I was looking at my parents' uh, copy of the New York Times, which had been delivered to, to the doorstep. And there was an article saying that Buster Keaton was making a movie, a short movie with the Irish playwright Samuel Beckett. And they were shooting, I think this is an exact quote, alongside a dilapidated warehouse in the shadow of the Brooklyn Bridge. I said to Lewis, we gotta go. This is our one shot. And I had just found in a local used bookstore an eight by 10 still of Buster. Uh, and I didn't know what it was from. I put it in a manila envelope and we took the subway down to the Canal Street exit, lower Manhattan, came up to the surface and looked around. There were several vacant lots. It was what they then called urban renewal was underway. And about two, three blocks away, we could see uh, some uh, Klieg lights and uh, uh, reflectors and things. That was the only sign that the movie was being made. No, uh, there was no trailer or RV, uh, you know, no, no sign of security anywhere either. As we walked closer, there was a, a car, a sedan, and in the back seat of the car, with his pork pie hat next to him on the seat <laughs> the newspaper was buster keaton wow I, so i sort of, i sort of poked my head in the rear window and said mr keaton he said yes i said hi my name is leonard balton blah 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 blah, blah. i'm a fan of yours this is my friend lewis and i found this still but i don't know what it's from would you help identify it for me that was my icebreaker that's great and uh he looked at it without a moment's hesitation. He said, yeah, I said, this is from Parlor, Bedroom, and Bath, which was one of his talking. But that's not the gal I, I work with in the scene. This Maybe this was a rehearsal shot. with was actually a foreign language. Oh, all right. Okay. Gotcha. And I said, would you mind signing it? No. He had a ballpoint pen, and he signed his name. And then, you know, I didn't know how to maintain a conversation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Lewis and I thanked him and sort of backed away as one would from a potentate seeing <laughs> an audience. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, uh, we we met Buster Keaton. That's incredible, isn't it? The P.S. The PS is a year later, well, a little over a year later, he was gone. He passed yeah, away. Right. And in the meantime, uh, the short that he was making, which was called Film, um, directed by Alan Schneider, stage director, debuted at the New York Film Festival. And we were there to see it. And uh, to bring an even fuller circle, decades later, I learned that I was just footsteps away from an actor named Jimmy Caron who he and his then wife were making an appearance in film. And Jimmy became one of my dearest friends. Oh, wow. And, and the reason he was there is he'd become very, very close to Buster ah. and remained close to his widow, Eleanor. Yeah. And uh, uh, Jimmy is a story all, all to himself. Kevin Brownlow had him host a very good uh, documentary for Turner Classic Movies. Uh, on Buster's uh, post-silent era, right, rest of his life, yeah, 
Yeah. If, 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 you're, if your listeners have ever seen Poltergeist, he's the realtor who sells them the house ah. in Poltergeist. Right. And if you've seen the China Syndrome, he's Jane Fonda's boss at the television station. Uh, he, he was a working actor. That's great. Oh, I fancy meeting Buster Keaton. That's just incredible. I think it's like it's like meeting God or something. It's r- ridiculous. Yeah. Ridiculous. Um, and you've also obviously met um, more people uh, connected with, you know, Laurel and Hardy. I mean, um, can you tell us a little bit about your meetings with Billy Gilbert, for instance, and Dorothy Granger? My first trip to Hollywood was in 1968. Um, and the purpose of coming here was to attend the Cinecom, which was the annual Labor Day gathering of the Society of Cinephiles. And uh, I missed out on, on attending Cinecon 1 because it was in um, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Jimmy Stewart's hometown. And the reason it was there was that the man who founded a magazine that was then called the 8 Millimeter Collector, uh, Sam Rubin, uh, wanted a chance to meet fellow film collectors, silent movie buffs. So that, that's why he formed this society and why he published a little, a little journal, a, a publication. But it would have meant riding for eight hours in the backseat of a Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> and that didn't sound like a good way to travel anywhere. <laughs> so I, I didn't go. But I went to Cinecon 2, which was in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Why? because someone volunteered to host it there. Someone was a a, a man named Clark Wilkinson who had started visiting Hollywood in 1928 and collecting autographs and memorabilia. He had one of the skeletons of King Kong. Wow. One of the metal armatures of King Kong. Wow. He had a a, a straw hat given to him by Harold Lloyd. Oh. (laughs) He had a... Photo, autograph photo of Greta Garbo. Good grief. Uh, and he has something I've never seen before or since. In his home, he had posters from like the first decade of, and a half of, of movies from the Edison Company, from other pioneering film companies, shellacked into his floor. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I don't know how many coats of clear wow. varnish. Uh, he applied, but you could walk on or over these, these movie posts. Oh, good grief. I've never heard of that before. Oh, that's that's incredible. Man. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, so that's how the Cinecon work, worked, is somebody had to volunteer to organize and host okay. at every a different city every year. So uh, uh, I think I started going in 1964. In 68, it was, it was being held in Hollywood. And uh, my parents were okay with me coming. They'd met some of the other members who were all adults, much older than me. Yeah. But those adults were very generous to me and very welcoming to me. A uh, cautious kid. Yeah. yeah <laughs> wasn't, wasn't shy. Yeah. And uh, I had been befriended by Bob Thomas the Hollywood biographer who was also the Associated Press Hollywood correspondent for 50 years or more. And uh, I told Bob that I was going to make this trip. And uh, who, who did who did he think I could get to meet? Right. And he said, you know, he says, I've been in this business decades and I have almost no friends in show business. His father before him had been a publicist, silent era. So he knew the difference between a friendship and a business acquaintanceship. Yeah. He knew everybody in Hollywood, but he didn't call them friends. Right. Okay. But he, he, one of his friends was Billy Gilbert. Me, Professor Theodore von Schwarzenhofer, MD, AD, DDS, FLD, FFF, and F. And so he, Put me in touch with uh, Billy's wife Ella, uh, known as Lolly, and she was part of. She she had a great history too. She was part of a, the McKenzie family, uh, 
uh, Bob McKenzie's in a lot of Hal Roach shorts. Oh, okay. Uh, heavy set man with a homely face and a distinctive laugh. He's in more our gang comedies, I think. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, but if you look him up, you may recognize him. Yes, I'm sure. Anyhow, anyhow I got to spend a, a wonderful afternoon with Mr. and Mrs. Gilbert. Billy had had a major stroke, uh, but uh, physically he was okay. Mentally, uh, he, he got stuck for words yeah. sometimes. But uh, Lolly knew all of his stories. <laughs> so, so she could fill in every blank. And <laughs> what really triggered him most was photographs. And they had a scrapbook of 11 by 14 portrait photo oh lovely of stars that he'd worked with which means everybody yes uh, yeah and, and they had all been signed personally to him or to him and lolly and they used to line the walls of the uh, recreation room they had uh, taken them down since put them into a scrapbook so we turned the page and there would be shirley temple and he said, oh, what a darling girl, you know, <laughs> trigger memories for him. And, uh, and whatever he didn't remember, Lolly did. And uh, they, they were just so kind to me. And then when, uh, when I was, got the job writing movie comedy teams, he agreed to write a foreword, which I suspect his wife wrote. Uh, <laughs> but will allow dramatic license. Okay? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's how I that's how I met him. Did he have any uh, memories of, of working with Stan and Babe? Can well, he know? loved them. Yeah. Like, like so many people, he, he loved them. And uh, of course, now looking back and sort of projecting my own thoughts onto him, it, it, that they let him run free, you might say. There's no attempt at restraining <laughs> yes. Uh, as the professor in the music box, let's yes, say. Absolutely. It's not what you'd call a subtle performer. <laughs> Nor would you want it to be. Exactly. I was going to say, you wouldn't want to restrain him. Just let him go. Fantastic. Right. That's right. No, no, he was very fond of him. Very lovely. He worked with Chaplin, too. You know, he's in The Great Dictator. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. He, gets, he got around, didn't he, Mr. Gilbert? He certainly did. And then, of course, he was uh, Sneezy, wasn't he, in um, Snow White, which it was, I think was my first film at the, at the cinema as well. I believe it was yours as well. That, that's that's mine, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, the last half, was it? I think you, you said. The last scene. The <laughs> last scene, yeah. In those days of continuous showings. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think this was a 1955 reissue. I would have been four years old. Right. Um, as impatient parents took their kids out of the theater because they, oh, it's over now. Yeah. It wasn't really, <laughs> they thought, all right, that's it, you can leave. Uh, my mother was taking me by the hand in. Yeah. So the first image I remember seeing on a movie screen is the last shot of Snow White. <laughs> Where the prince is leading her into a golden sun. Bit of a spoiler for the next time you see the rest of it, isn't it, really? Yes, well. <laughs> Never mind, though. Never mind, that's great. And uh, and Dorothy Granger. This is an outrage, an absolute outrage. Maybe it is, and maybe it ain't. I can't remember how I got in touch with her. I, I was racking my brain to try to remember. Because you were good friends with Dorothy, weren't you? Did you stay friends with Dorothy? Oh, yes, very much so. Yeah, I thought, yeah. Uh, they, uh, she and her husband, Jack, uh, had an upholstery store on the west side of Los Angeles. And uh, their favorite restaurant was Trader Vic's, an exotic uh, Polynesian Hawaiian style restaurant that was in the Beverly Hilton Hotel. They insisted on taking, well, that was the second time I met her, maybe third. Uh, by that time I got married, 1975, I brought my wife Alice out for the first time to California and dined with uh, Dorothy and Jack, and Georgie Jessel was there that night. We were very excited. <laughs> Dorothy said, oh, there's Burt Reynolds over there. We said, the hell with him, that's <laughs> Georgie Jessel. Brilliant. 
<laughs> oh, that's great. Love it. Anyway, Dorothy, Dorothy was one of those um, interviewees that a writer or biographer or researcher prays for. Right. Uh, someone with a really good memory. Yes. Yeah. Uh, she remembered so much and she had scrapbooks and a lot of photographs right. and, um, and she was just a, a great resource. And when I'm, when I'm describing her career to people, I say she had bit parts in feature films and was a leading lady in two reelers. My queen. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you as well, just just before um, we got on to uh, the Atoll question, Leonard, I wanted to just ask you about um, the... You were at the first Sons of the Desert Banquet, I believe. Unforgettable. Unforgettable. Yeah, tell me about that, because obviously there's no time machines yet, but, uh, you know... I can tell you a fair amount about it, because it was such it made such a deep impression on me. Yeah. Um, my father took me and I think yeah, me and my friend Lewis uh, to this banquet. And it was the only, it wasn't considered a meeting. Yeah. It was a special event. Uh, we were not uh, welcome at meetings because that was for growing ups only. Right. When we were like 13. Uh, and I took black and white photos with my brownie camera, but it overflashed. So all of those pictures <laughs> washed out. Yeah. I know who's in them, and I can yeah. identify who's in them. <laughs> but I'm not sure that anyone else could. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it was held at the Lambs Club, a venerable actors uh, club organization. They owned a building just off Times Square, right. the theater district. So it was convenient for stage actors to drop in before yeah. or after a show. They had some residential rooms upstairs uh, and they had reciprocity with the Garrick Club in London. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, and they had had in their heyday, which was, I think, the teens and 20s, memorabilia on the wall that was uh, incomparable. Uh, anyone and everyone of note seems to have come through that door or performed in their annual Lambs Gamble, spelled G-A-M-B-O-L. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what they called their big hoop de doo That's good. And uh, the night of that banquet, um, Orson Bean, the late Orson Bean was there. I don't know how familiar uh, he, he is to, uh, to Brits. He was a, a staple on live television when I was growing up. Right. I know the name, but yeah, I, I couldn't. On panel shows. And all. He's in a handful of movies, hmm. um, uh, but he was more known to me as a television personality. Right. He, he was a stand-up comedian, and a pretty good one. Uh, he told a story once. This is another detour. He told <laughs> a story once about going by a men's haberdasher and looking in the window, and they had uh, monogrammed handkerchiefs. Right. And the sample was embroidered your name so that it showed you that's what they could do for yes. you. Yes. Yeah. And he went and said, I want to buy a handkerchief that says your name. The salesman said, my name? No, not your name. Your name. <laughs> that was Orson Bean. He was one of the founders of the Sons of the Dead. Right, right. Uh, and uh, Suki Sales. Uh, who was another popular TV personality, right. known for his high uh, throw, pine face, oh, okay. yeah, uh, children's television. Right. Uh, uh, again, these are American, you know, yeah, uh, folks. That uh, now was it at that first banquet that uh, Raymond Walburn, wonderful old character actor, either at the first or second. Will Jordan, a very funny uh, mimic, uh, nightclub comic mimic, who became famous for uh, impersonating Ed Sullivan, oh, right. the host and, and entrepreneur of uh, long-running uh, 
American Institution yeah. on Sunday nights, our long variety show. Yeah. And um, uh, Stan's uh, uh, wife, Ida, was there. Oh, lovely. And and his, his Al Roach's business manager, Ben Shipman, was there. Yeah. Um, wow. It would, and everyone who spoke was very funny. I mean, I don't know that I've ever laughed so much in my life as I did oh, that. That's great. Oh, and uh, it, it, it was it was possible to duplicate. And it's around that same time I became friendly with Al Kilgore. Right. Okay. Al Kilgore, who had drawn the most wonderful. I'll call them caricatures, but they were more than that, really. Mm. Uh, renderings, let's call them, mm. of Stan and Ollie that appear as the fr the, what you call the frontispiece or book. Yes. Book yeah. Of Don McCabe's Mr. Laurel and Mr. Hardy. Ah, uh, yes, yes, of course. Yes. Yeah, they're fabulous. Wonderful, wonderful mm. interpretations of yeah. Stan, in, in, Stan and Ollie in character. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, Italian, uh, isn't he? Uh, and he made his living as a cartoonist and sometimes caricaturist but he was also an old movie buff of the highest order right and a collector 16 millimeter collector he lived in queens and um he uh he he welcomed me in and um, he and his wife again was so kind and generous and uh made me feel uh, like an adult yeah that was, the, that was the marvel of of my my adolescence was that people treated me as a, on an equal plane that's lovely it was yes it was it was magical yeah that's great what a, what, yeah, what memories um i wanted also just to ask you as well i remember that um from your from in your book starstruck you mentioned that um you were a huge fan of reading variety when yeah you were, when you were younger um and obviously you know, when I th when I think of variety, I always think about how kind of cruel they were to Laurel and Hardy. Mm. Um, and you know, I don't think I've ever seen a, a good report of a Laurel and Hardy film in Variety, unfortunately. Um, so I'm so I was just surprised that that didn't sort of colour your 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 sort of view of of that. Well, I I wasn't reading the back issues of Variety. Oh, okay. I was reading it in the uh, '60s. Okay, these are the modern the early ones. Early '60s, uh, on into the '70s. And I always had to wash my hands afterwards because the newsprint <laughs> so heavily laid on that right. my, my fingers were all blackened. Uh, this is weekly variety. I live, now I live in LA where, where they always had a daily variety. Ah, right, right. And, uh, but the original weekly variety was, uh, uh, the, it was called the Show Business Bible. Yeah. That's how everybody referred to it. But no, I didn't ever encounter uh, any unkind words about Laurel and Hardy. If I had, I would have become apoplectic. <laughs> That's great. That's fantastic. Um, is it, is it Youngson who says in one of the films, one of his compilation films, nobody loved them but the public? I think it was, yeah. It's very true, I think, yeah, as well. Yeah. Very, very true, yeah. Although I think, I mean... You know, as I'm researching the book that I'm writing, there's a lot of trade papers that certainly, as they start to get going from 27 almost, they, they can't do any wrong. Um, and it builds and builds. But I think it, it must start to tail off, you know, as, as we get further on. But from 27, 28, 29, they're, they're sort of riding high on the crest of a wave. And uh, all the critics seem to love it. Variety very rarely mention them at all. But um, it's only if there's a little bit of... Uh, information aside from the films they want to report but um yeah it's all good it's all good stuff um i could i could ask you questions all night Leonard, but i'm not allowed to because obviously <laughs> time is against us um i'm going to ask you the atoll question i have to ask you the atoll question um so i'm going to strand you i'm afraid on a deserted atoll mm -hmm. but you are being allowed to take with you four laurel and hardy related items well, with yeah, you that's not, that's not at all k it could be, it could be. <laughs> uh, a silent short, you can have a talkie short, uh, a feature film, and a Laurel and Hardy related book. 
so can you make your selections, starting with the silent short, and explain why you're keeping them for me? Silent short would probably be either big business or two tars. Okay, good choices. Good choices. I, I'd have to make the ultimate choice, but I can't do it right now. <laughs> What do you what do you like? Because they, they're quite sort of. Um, I mean, they're both brilliant, brilliant shorts. Um, heavily reciprocal destruction focused. Yeah, is, exactly. is that the kind, is that the kind of thing you like, Leonard? Is it the sort of the build well, when they do it? Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> um, I just it just so darn funny. Uh, maybe two tars. Two tars is a little more elaborate than big business. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> other settings and other people yes that's true two tars yeah good choice good choice um and your talkie short the music box oh straight in there no 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 hesitation no hesitation a lot of others that i like just almost as well yeah but that's I me mean, it's sort of a definitive laurel and hardy film yes yes it is isn't it yeah it is um well, I mean, I can't argue with that. It's a, it's a really hard question, the talkie short, because as you say, there are so many good ones. And I think every time you watch one, you think, oh, that that might be the best one. And then you watch another if one. I, I have a favorite scene. Okay. The opening scene of Toad in a Hole. Oh, yes. Yeah. Ollie is singing out fresh fish <laughs> with relish, he sings, you know. Yes. <laughs> success a nice little fish business and making money and then Stan uncharacteristically makes a proposal you know Ollie I, I've been thinking what about I I know how we could make a lot more money how well if, if we caught our own fish we wouldn't have to pay for it then whoever we sold it to, it would be clear profit. And Ollie says, tell me that, that again. again. Well, if, if you caught a fish and whoever you sold it to, they wouldn't have to pay for it. Then the profits would go to the fish if, uh, if you Stan is completely unable to reproduce what he said. Yes, yeah. But to me, if there's a definitive Laurel and Hardy moment, that's it. That's it. That is absolutely it. I love it. Um, okay, and your your feature film? Sons of the Desert. Sons of the Desert. Good choice. It's a good choice. What is it about Sons of the Desert you love, Leonard? Uh, everything. Um uh, Again, it's kind of a definitive Laurel and Hardy film. Yeah. It stands on gags and ideas and themes that they had used before in their silent comedies. Yeah. Um, more fleshed out. Yeah. And uh, uh, Billy Gilbert's there. Never, never a bad thing. <laughs> um, Charlie Chase is in it. I love Charlie Chase. Uh, Honolulu Baby is is there. Yeah. May Bush, well, of course. Yeah, the ever popular May Bush. <laughs> what, what more could one ask? Hello? 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 I bet you can't guess who this is. <laughs> All right. Who is it? It's your little brother, Charlie. <laughs> well, for goodness sake, it's my brother, Charlie. Uh, where are you? I'm out in Chicago. They're throwing a convention for me. 
<laughs> well, fancy hearing from you after all these years. You know, Charlie, I haven't seen you since you sang in the choir. And you used to pump the organ, remember? You little organ pumper, you. <laughs> <laughs> See, listen, I want you to talk to a fellow from Los Angeles. A swell guy. Wait a minute. Hello. So this is Charlie's sweet little sister. <laughs> I feel just like I know you. <laughs> Uh, Charlie tells me you're from Los Angeles. Uh, what part? All of me. <laughs> What'd you say? What, what, what'd you say? She asked me if I was from Los Angeles, and I said yes. Then she said, what part? And I said, all of me. What a lot of dollars. Wonderful. And, um, and unfortunately, you, you can't select your own, but a Laurel and Hardy related book. Uh, Tom McCabe's biography. Good choice. Good choice. I think it's the first book that probably all of us read, no matter what generation yeah. you, you're in. Yeah, it's, the, it's it has to be the first one. It's a lovely, lovely book. Um, fantastic. Fantastic. Leonard, thank you so much for, for spending this time with us today. It's been an absolute treat to chat with you. And, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to uh, to do this again sometime and we can explore some more of your your memories and your love of, of Laurel and Hardy. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, Patrick. Thank you. He is a great guy, isn't he? He certainly is. You know I like him. Well, well, well. How about that? I really, really enjoyed that time with Leonard. What a great guy. Um, and don't forget, you can access an exclusive extra slice of that interview with Leonard Maltin just by signing up to one of our two Patreon tiers uh, on patreon.com. Uh, and there is a direct link to that in the show notes as usual. And also on our website, of course, laurelandhardyfilms.com. Also, do check out that website if you haven't already subscribed to receive your Laurel and Hardy magazine. Sign up today and issue number four will be winging its way to your door. In this latest issue, we take a close look at the boys' masterpiece, Big Business, with exclusive articles written by Richard W. Ban and Bob Satterfield. Um, and there's also a fascinating and nostalgic article by Glenn Mitchell all about the numerous Laurel and Hardy vinyl records that have been released over the years. Um, oh, and we also get a sneak peek into Danny Backer and Bernie Hoje's forthcoming book, Collecting Laurel and Hardy. It's a jaw-dropping, wonderful publication. Um, super high-quality magazine, uh, beautifully designed by my good friend Russell Babbage. So do head over to laurelandhardyfilms.com to check that out as well. Next time on the podcast, we return to our chronological look at the boys' lives and career as we focus on their 36th film and second talkie, the often criticised Birthmarks. So all that remains is to thank our very special guest once again, Leonard Moulton. Thank you to the Bohunks Orchestra and Basta Music for the wonderful music. And most importantly, thank you for choosing to spend this time with me again. And until next time, it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye from him. Goodbye. And a very goodbye from me. Goodbye.